very much, distinguished invitees, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I'm delighted to be addressing you today, especially given recent developments in the Caribbean. I want to start by congratulating the organizers of this forum and to wish you the very best and encourage you, the INC, to further the work that you've been doing. We are at a very critical stage in the evolution of this industry, and surely your leadership on many issues is absolutely welcome. The citizenship by investment industry is a critical industry for the small islands of the Eastern Caribbean. You may have heard recently that in some instances, the contribution to national revenue is as high as 60%. In the case of St. Lucia, it is below 10%, but still is very significant. For some of you, this is just a profession, and others, just another business venture. For us, it is the livelihoods of thousands of persons. It is the financing of our national development and the creation of civilized standards of living for our citizens. It matters to us. As small islands, we've been through an intense struggle for survival in an international system which is proving more and more to be insensitive to our challenges. We face the destruction of our banana industry when we produce less than 1% of global production. We face the dismantling of our financial services sector when we were responsible for less than 1% of global financial transactions. We are facing historic climatic consequences due to global warming when we produce less than 1% of global emissions. Now we are facing severe threats to our citizenship investment programs when we are responsible for less than 1% of global migratory movements. Think about it. The citizenship by investment programs in our region account for less than 7,500 person, persons annually, compared to one European country allowing one million refugees in their country. And last year, there were over 400,000 illegal migrants in the European Union with no due diligence, with no financial checks on their backgrounds. Now, there are even whispers that concessions and incentives regimes that attract foreign direct investments must be reviewed as it distorts the movement of capital. So it is with a sense of responsibility that I address you to update on the happenings in the industry from the perspective of St. Lucia. So if you are looking for a topic for my address, it would be building resilience and sustainability in the immigration investment industry, the perspective of St. Lucia. The importance of the industry underscores the need for accurate information. This must be the basis for any resilient and sustainable industry. This industry has become notorious for salacious stories about countries, individuals, and companies. I have learned that in public life you must ride the waves, but remain unflinching in your focus and determination. However, Misinformation and inaccurate information can affect the image of sovereign countries to the detriment of its government and people. Having said so, let me carry a story which was carried in a publication recently and has been widely quoted. In that story, it is suggested that the CIP in St. Lucia had not met the stated objective of contributing to national revenue. For the record, and these are the facts, in St. Lucia, the National Economic Fund earned 24 million US dollars net, of which $16.9 million was transferred to central government and used to pay debt. We received US $14.8 million from CIP bonds, and a further $6.5 million US dollars was received as surplus operating revenue, which were used to supplement funding for national security, healthcare, social development, and infrastructural development. This means that central government received 38.2 million US, or a total of 101.9 million EC, which was more than what was budgeted. Then I read a story in the same publication, attributed to the leader of the opposition, 
that Solution was selling a secret infrastructure option. It is a bit bewildering that you can only offer something and yet still it remains a secret. Truth is, the new option was gazetted, meaning it was published publicly in the recognized publication, which is a legal announcement of laws, regulations, and other government businesses. The new option was published by Extraordinary Gazette on December 20th, 2023. A memo was then sent out on February 1st, 2024, indicating a commencement date of February 5th. It meant that the opposition had more than a month to table a motion in Parliament requesting a parliamentary debate on the new option as published. This is how our parliamentary system works. If any parliamentarian opposes a change in the regulations of the CIP, they can table a motion for debate. None was tabled. So how secret is the new option? Maybe the publication meant that the details of the contract with the developer involved was not publicized. Of course, my feedback would be that commercial agreements are never printed for public dissemination. The story also claimed that solution was underselling its real estate options. I'm sure we'll, you'll agree with me that no one knows better than you what goes on in this industry. You know it better than me. Whether it is financing, buyback, underselling, you know of the practices and for how long it has been going on. We receive regular market intelligence reports, and like you, we know what's going on. I can assure you that we do try, ceaselessly and endlessly, to dissuade and discourage such practices. The truth is, we are limited in what we can do. I can't speak for others, but I know that we've included in our contracts the requirement that such practices are prohibited. In any event, for the record, Solution no longer has any real estate offerings. So I'm not sure exactly what it was meant in the publication. We have had only one real estate offering, and it is fully subscribed. For the record, and for the sake of building a resilient and sustainable industry, any promoter or agent who engages in offering citizenship through any of our options below the regulated prices will be sanctioned and possibly banned from conducting business with St. Lucia. And I want to make that very clear. We do not support underpricing and the marketing of any offering below the regulated price. Similarly, we do not support any promotion of St. Lucia as offering visa-free access to the UK or EU or any country for that matter. Our offering of citizenship is not on the premise of any visa-free access to any country. It is very clear that these visa-free indexes are becoming a problem with our international partners. But having said that, we all know how this industry is structured. It is commission-based, which means that very commissions are offered in private commercial agreements. Secondly, and more challenging, it is multi-layered so that from the top, the number of agents, promoters, and contacts cascade downwards, each level with less control and direction from the top. Thirdly, it is extraterritorial, so we can license authorized agents in St. Lucia and monitor their conduct, but how do we license and monitor a player in some distant city? So critical for resilience and sustainability is how do we fashion a proper licensing and monitoring system that only allows for legal and ethical players to be involved. In St. Lucia, we have taken an approach that we don't see the need to speak ill of any company, individual, or country in the conduct of our, of our business or management of state affairs. This is just not necessary in the industry. The business space for this industry is large enough for all countries, companies and individuals to conduct legal and ethical business and be profitable. As we struggle to regulate this industry to ensure that its business is conducted in an ethical and legal manner, let us not denigrate or slander others. It only undermines the viability of the industry. Now let us turn to the historic action of the last few weeks the signing of the MOE by four Caribbean countries 
but excluding St. Lucia. From the onset, I want to state that St. Lucia fully supports the actions of the four countries, and we believe that such an action will augur well for the development of the industry. In no circumstances should anyone find comfort in interpreting our non-signature at this time as a weakening of our commitment to regional cooperation and collaboration. In fact, our action is an affirmation of that commitment. We agree with every single provision of the MOA, except the immediate increase of the minimum investment level. Our view is that we have just signed contracts which will significantly enhance our infrastructure, including roads, housing, and community facilities. These contracts, will re these contracts require developers to secure financing for execution in advance of recouping the expenditure and were based on existing prices. We cannot, in good conscience, change the conditions of the contract in such a fundamental manner. We had no difficulty in our colleagues pursuing a path which they felt was necessary. These countries have faced serious economic challenges in a difficult economic environment where options for concessionary loans for national development have dried up, where grants to assist in financing infrastructure are disappearing, and where inflation, inflationary prices are wreaking havoc on our quality of lives. Despite these circumstances, these islands have been able to build roads, build health centers, houses, build community centers, and pay their debts with earnings from the Citizenship by Investment Program. We supported the move to secure the national interests. Likewise, we will always act to protect our national interests. We had hoped for a grandfather clause to allow us to fulfill our contracts and still be able to sign, but that was not to be. We still believe, though, that the best approach to solving our regional challenges is through collaborative action, and we will continue to work as a region to achieve such. Yet, We've been chastised by some for not signing. So let me remind you of the history of the CIP in St. Lucia. And in so doing, I will lay the elements of what we saw as needed to build a resilient and sustainable industry. After reviewing the industry landscape in 2015, St. Lucia was of the view that the future of the industry must be built on a robust and rigid due diligence foundation. It is for that reason that we have built a due diligence capability which is fit for purpose. Since 2021, St. Lucia has taken action to further strengthen its capabilities. Our due diligence fund covers documentary verification, intelligence review, law enforcement review, and financial review. Sometimes we are criticized in St. Lucia for taking too long for approvals but we are satisfied that we must do whatever we can to ensure that our approvals are based on the most rigorous examination of applicants. We are also of the view that the program should never be presented as a transactional, but rather as an interactional engagement. A transactional approach will simply reinforce the view that we were just selling passports. Instead, we felt we should present the industry as securing investments through citizenship. We still believe that we do not sell passports. Part of the negative perception of this industry is derived from the language used by its stakeholders. The sustainability of the industry will rest on developing it as a well-regulated, interaction-based industry, which provides financing and investment for the countries which offer citizenship. So maybe the IMC can take the lead in rebranding the image of the industry and working to get rid of the language and perception that we are simply involved in selling passports. When we opened our offices in January 2016, we employed a citizen's relationship officer whose duty was to contact every new citizen and outline a program of engagement to build a sense of belonging and connectedness to St. Lucia.